morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Wesley. My name is Pastor Sylvia Harris, and as always, it's a joy to be with you. Before anybody else asks, I gave my family the Sunday off. Everybody is healthy. There is nothing wrong. They just needed a Sunday at home, and they have full permission from their pastor to do that today, okay? So I do have some announcements for you this morning. As always, the back of your bulletin does contain dates and such for you to take a look at. We will be meeting again this morning after worship to continue discussing and exploring the history of Wesley as we dig into what are our strengths, what are our values, who are we as Wesley. I don't know about you all, but I was very touched last week by hearing the stories of Wesley's origins and hearing from people who were there from firsthand testimony of what those early days of Wesley were truly like. Um, that is such a gift that we have that we are able to dig into our roots in such a way. And, it, it, and I know there are some of you who brought some artifacts for us to take a look at today. Technically, they're called artifacts. They're part of our history. It's not, <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Um, but I'm excited to look at those and see if we can make some copies and be able to share some of those other pieces of our history. So if you weren't planning on staying, change your, change your plans and plan on staying one more Sunday so we can keep doing this work of looking at our history. Uh, there was a change in the dates with our partnership with Embry Health. You may have noticed there's a pod over in the parking lot. They've started dropping off supplies, but they won't actually start the drive through testing until this Wednesday. So it's going to start on the 23rd of February, and it's going to run to the 23rd of August, drive through testing here at the church for COVID. Um, as another announcement, we are going to start what we are calling Munch and Mingle. It's going to be on the third Wednesday of the month from 12 to 1.30. We're inviting you to bring your own food. We're not going to provide it. Everybody brings their own food. We'll gather over in the fellowship hall and have an opportunity to get together outside of worship. Um, we'll be socially distanced. Masks are always, always encouraged if you're not comfortable. And also, like we said, bring your own food. We're not going to be sharing. Um, Part of what we're going to do with this, though, is not just munch and mingle, but we're also going to be collecting non-perishable food items between now and then, so that when we gather, we can put together bags, bags of food for people who are experiencing food insecurities. Okay, so bring your non-perishable food donations to the church, and then plan on being with us on Wednesday, March the 16th. I have the date right, I think, yes. Wednesday, March the 16th for that first munch and mingle. If you have any questions, let me know, or you can let one of our wonderful lay leaders, Miss Lucy McCray, know. She's going to be helping me organize and run this. Those are my announcements, short and sweet compared to some other Sundays. So I'm now, now going to invite Ginger to come up and share with us this morning for Black History Month. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning on technology and as you know I'm not as young as the people who do technology well so please bear with me okay mom I'll speak louder I'll speak louder is this is this working no no okay black and slave population in the United States from 1790 to 1880 there were 700,000 slaves in the United States beginning in 1790 they were brought over from Africa on slave ships to work the cotton, sugar, and tobacco fields. By uh, also the British Empire, they used the slaves as well. They brought the slaves over. They, excuse me, starting in 1790, there was approximately 18% of the total population were slaves. Also, people who were born, children who were born, babies who were born, they were sometimes born into slavery. In the years that followed the independence, the Northern states gradually began prohibiting slavery, and it was officially abolished by 1805. The, import, the importation of slave labor was prohibited nationwide from 1808. Although it still 
existed and was practiced in the South. The election of President Abraham Lincoln, he promised to prohibit slavery in the newly acquired territories of the West, leading to the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. Although the Confederacy of the South were victorious in much of the early stages of the war, the strength in numbers of the northern states, including many free black men, eventually resulted in the victory of the Union and the nationwide abolishment of slavery with the 13th Amendment. In total, an estimated 12 to 13 million of the Africans were transported to America as slaves. This does not even include the 23% that did not make it. Uh, the most prominent themes have been the civil rights movement and voter suppression, mass incarceration, and the release and the relationship between the police and the African American community has taken a spotlight in recent years. The civil rights movement. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s came about as a need to desire for equality and freedom for African Americans and other people of color. Nearly 100 years after slavery was abolished, there was widespread segregation, discrimination, disenfranchisement, and racially motivated violence that permeated all personal and structural aspects of life for black people. Jim Crow laws at the local and state levels barred African Americans from classrooms, bathrooms, theaters, train cars, juries, and legislatures. During this period of time, there was a huge surge of act activism taking the place to reverse, taking place to reverse this discrimination and injustice. Some of those events were the Montgomery bus boycott the Greensboro Woolworth sit out, sit in rather, uh, in order to bring about change. Much of this organizing and activism took place in the southern part of the United States. However, people from all over the country and all races and religions joined activists to proclaim their support and commitment to freedom and equality. For example, on August 28, 1963, 250,000 Americans came to Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. They came to have their voices heard and listen to speeches by many civil rights leaders, especially Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who delivered what would become the most influential speeches in history. Between 1954 and 1968, civil rights legislation was passed. Fundamental and lasting change was made during this relatively short period of time, and its impact can be seen in a myriad of ways in our society today. 1954, the Supreme Court, Brown versus the Board of Education, ruled that schools could no longer be segregated and the state laws establishing separate public schools for black and white students was unconstitutional. 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited discrimination in public places, provided for the integration of schools and other public facilities and made employment discrimination illegal based on race, color, religion, or national origin. The document was the most sweeping civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. 1965, the Voter Rights Act of 1965 was passed. This legislation protected minority voting rights, barring states from passing laws that would discriminate against minorities with a history of voting discrimination to get approval from the federal government before making changes to their voting laws or procedures. 1968. Finally, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, commonly known as the Fair Housing Act, provided equal housing opportunities regardless of race, creed, national origin, 
and made it illegal to interfere with housing rights and opportunity. However, civil rights issues such as immigration, racial disparities in the criminal justice system, the perpetual segregation of our nation's schools, to name just a few, remain and are in need of ongoing work. We've come a long way, but we still have a ways to go. Thank you. my call to worship, I've asked the pastor to give me five minutes so I can tell you people that you have to be grateful that I'm sitting and standing here. Thursday before last, I came home from work. One of my patients is going back to India. So, you know, we have a good time with them. And then I went home, take a shower, eat, and then went to bed. And then I have this dream. It's my funeral. I'm there. And the voice is telling me, this is your funeral. People were cooking, doing all kind of things. And I'm walking there. What are you doing? I'm crying. What are you doing? I'm, I'm walking there. I'm looking at everybody busy telling me. The voice is still telling me, this is your funeral. And on the other side, I had people saying, come on, Agatha, your grave is ready. Come on, come over. So I went there and I see this new fresh grave. He said, that's your grave. I'm like, oh no. So I, <laughs> I, I, I demolished the grave. And on, underneath the grave, it says 5.35 a.m. I woke up and my clock right in front of me says 5.35 a.m. All of a sudden, I lost it. I said, okay, let me drink some water, maybe indigestion. I drank two bottles of water. Uh oh, my chest is still heavy. I'm like, okay, let me take a can of salsa. I took the salsa, hoping that I will bob. No, my chest. I said, oh my God, what's wrong? So I grabbed my monitor for my blood pressure. It was 275 over 171. I'm like, oh my God. And then I start feeling so bad. I called my friend. I said, Nui, come right now and take me to the hospital. She lives in Mary Cooper. So the moment I'm waiting for her, I'm still feeling so bad. I said, Lord, I'm going to drive myself to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I jumped in my car and I drove myself to my physician. He said, I want you to go to the emergency or urgent care. Well, urgent care is like one block from there on 48th Street or something, and, and baseline. So I went there. I get so scared, you know, when people are running, running, and running. And then finally they said, oh, no, we have to call up the in emergency hospital so you can go. I said, don't call them. I can drive myself. No, you can't. <laughs> I said, yes, I can. He said, do you know what you're playing with? I said, please, let me drive myself. So I drove my, they said, sign here. So it should be in case you die on your way. And I signed. So I went to Banner Health Emergency, parked my car, and I went over there. And I told them, and that I just stay there, you're not gonna work at all. So they gave me a cart, they took me to the emergency, and they're like, oh, how did you get here? I said, I drove myself. Are you crazy? Right there, and I have to tell you guys, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna die. With all the injection, the IV, the, my stomach, every two hours, they have to give me injection on my stomach. They have to take my blood. Then I'm like, oh my God, it's good that I'm still using my fingers. So they called the doctor, the heart doctor and, my, and the physician. They are like, you have to be admitted. We are not going to let you go home. We're going to admit you. I said, please let me go. He said, do you know what you are playing with? Your blood pressure is 176 over 175 now. You can die at any time from stroke or cardiac arrest. So I was admitted and all I did was to pray. 
and then they took to Aswabi. And I said to myself, how many doctors? You know, like when doctors see something very strange, they always call their colleagues because I've experienced that. I saw more than seven cardiologists. Everybody's coming and they're, are you okay? Are you okay? Please, let us do this test. They did so much tests that I'm like, please, please let me go home. So they kept me there. Even though they, when, even though they kept me there, and I was crying that I want to go home, I refused to call anybody because I don't want people to panic. But then I said to myself, no, I can't trust one person and tell her not to tell anybody. So I took my phone and I called Azera. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't tell anybody. She said, I, um, Agatha, I'm not going to tell anybody, but I have to tell one person, the pastor. I said, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I was there. And yet still, they can't find out what's wrong with me. And then they refer me to an insulin doctor that is taking care of me. So I am so grateful and I am so blessed because it could have been something else. So I thank God for being here and I thank you all for all the calls and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, now back to the service. <laughs> Our call to worship. Can we stand, please? Come and learn the ways of life. We have come to follow Jesus. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. We have come to follow Jesus. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who persecute you. We have come to follow Jesus. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We, we have come, come to follow Jesus. Come, come and learn the ways of life. Our hymn is hymn 371. I stand amazed in the presence.
place before us. Strengthen our resolves to spread your word and ways, and remind us that your guidance is always present through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 27 to 38. Luke 6, 27 to 38. Love for enemy. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And for anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your, your, your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love one another, those who, if you, if, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you learn to, if you learn from those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners learn from sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it shall be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you will get back. A second lesson reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 13. The gift of love. Love never ends. But as for prophecy, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reason like a child. When I become an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. This has been the word of God to the people of God. Thanks. And all God's children said, God, thank thank you. God. God. Would you please pray with me? God of our faith, in whom we hope and from whom we know love, we come before you this day asking for the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts and minds of all those hearing my voice be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, my friends, we have made it to this final week of 1 Corinthians 13. We started the month off with talking about that anything we do, if it lacks love, is worthless. We are bankrupt without love. And then last week, we talked about what love is and what love is not. We examined how sometimes it truly is hardest to love those closest to us. 
I ask you to think about who is missing from these pews because of our inabilities to love those closest to us. I even confess to you the ways that at times I fail to love in my own home. And so now today, we have reached these final verses of 1 Corinthians 13, the ones that, that talk us through love's never-ending nature. As Paul writes, love never ends. Since love never ends, we can say that love was and is and is to come. Paul even tells us that some things, he gives us some very specific things that we know will come to an end. He says prophecies, talking in tongues and knowledge, all of these things, these greatest of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're going to end. The things that are dividing the church in Corinth, they're not going to last. They're going to come to an end. At some point, all of these things that are final are going to end. And that includes the very gifts of the Holy Spirit, the things that we receive through faith in Christ, the down payment that we have on the promises of God. Those very gifts, at some point, are going to cease. <coughs> There are so many things in this world, in this place that we call home, beyond the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are so many things that are, in fact, finite. Things that have an ending. No matter what we may want or wish or cling to, things that will end. I'm not going to tell you that finitude, the, the finality of things and the limited nature of things, I'm not going to tell you that conflicts and disputes are always based on, are only based on finitude, limited capacities, limited resources. I'm not going to say that's the only reason we have disputes, but I can't help but think that for some reason, a lot of what we struggle with, a lot of the conflicts that we experience are due to the very limited nature of the world and the way that in our humanity we focus on things that end and we cling to them as if they're going to last forever. Let me explain what I mean. Paul writes in this section, he writes, we know only in part. We know only in part. What we see, what we experience, what we understand in this world can only ever be known, seen, experienced, understood, etc. It can only ever be known in part. We cannot, in this world that is still yet separated from the fullness, from the completeness of God's presence dwelling with humanity, we are not yet at that final victory and so we cannot, in this world, experience the fullness, the totality, the completeness of what God is like. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even as the new world, the kingdom of God that has been breaking in ever since the resurrection of Christ, even as that newness that continues to break in every day, even as that newness is here, we are still yet not at that place of the fullness of God's presence. And so because we are not yet there, we still see in this very limited capacity. This is something that has been since the time of Eden, my friends, since the time of Cain and Abel. When Cain killed his brother, he did it out of jealousy, out of the belief that who he was and what he had to offer was never going to be enough. He saw and understood the world in a finite way and grasped at the only thing he could do, which to him was to kill his brother. The desire to destroy that which threatens us, which threatens our access, which we perceive as being part of limitations in this world, is a greater threat than I think we care to acknowledge. 
For Cain, that threat came in the form of his own brother. And murder, the complete destruction of the other, was his only option. When we see the world through this lens of finitude, through what some people term a scarcity mindset, a mindset that says there's never going to be enough, when we see the world through that lens, we become scared. If we believe that there is never going to be enough, whether that is enough food or money or power or love or joy or opportunity, whatever it is that we want in our deepest self, when we believe that there is not going to be enough of that available to us, we become scared. And we live from the space of fear. Does that make sense? When we live from this, this place of fear-driven scarcity, of fear-driven finitude, we cling to anything that we can grasp onto. We cling to things that we know are finite, that we know are limited. Because we are driven by fear, we end up clinging to things that we know are going to end. We can see how this plays out right now on the international level very clearly. If we look to the other side of the world, there is a war breaking out right in front of everyone's eyes. Everyone on the international stage is watching and waiting even as two sides are reporting very different realities of what is unfolding. We can see this need on one side to cling to power and resources, to grasp at what is not theirs to grasp, simply to assure that they have more. That they have more. And we can see how on the other side, the other side is simply clinging on to what resources, what power they have, trying to defend and take care of. All the while, both sides knowing it's all limited. We can look right now to the spinitude mind mindset, the scarcity mindset that is playing out right here in our state as we're in the midst of another election cycle. All you need to do is listen to the ad campaigns that report an invasion at our borders. An invasion that looks much different than the invasion on the other side of the world. And yet, you listen to the language and you listen to the rhetoric as this invasion of illegals. Language in its very self that takes away the humanity of individuals, right? Turns them into a criminal, organizational kind of structure regardless of the motivations, regardless of the actual activity that is happening. You listen to the rhetoric and you hear the invasion of illegals coming to take, coming to grasp, coming to steal what is limited. But because we have this need to grasp, we have this need for ourselves to hold on to as much of the resources, power, opportunity, etc. because we want to hold on to as much of it as we can for ourselves, in our humanness, it becomes necessary in some ways to turn the other into something less, to dehumanize the other for the sake of our need to cling to what we have claimed as ours and ours alone. There are other examples of the ways in which we grasp for resources, we grasp for things to make sure that we have enough, to make sure that we are enough. Make sure that we have enough money, to make sure that we have enough respect, to make sure we have enough ability. We grasp at status in our society, ensuring that we have the access to resources and opportunities while ignoring those who are kept out of the excess lanes already established. There's a line that goes something like this. 
The system isn't broken. It's doing what it was designed to do all along. In other words, we are surrounded by systems and structures that are inherently designed to grasp at power, to hold on to the resources and opportunities, to keep all those things which ultimately end, but to keep them all for those who the world has already deemed worthy by the original system's design. So oftentimes in our culture, if we look around and we're being completely honest, it's not even as if we are grasping just to survive. It's grasping so that we can have more than enough, more than what others have, because it's the only way to ensure that we come out ahead. I'm not really sure what the end goal is, where or how or when that accounting is going to take place of what and who and all that has been achieved, you know, so that we come out ahead at the end. I'm not really sure what that looks like because the reality is it's all going to end anyway. We focus on so much that at the end, it's not going to be there. We focus on so much that if we're being really honest with ourselves, those things we focus on, they're not going to make it through the refiner's fire. Who can get the highest paying job? The most recognition and accolades? Who's the most gifted and talented in this area? Social media has historically been covered with ways that people like to shine a light on their life to make it look just right. But the thing about this showing off way of being and this driven way to be in the highest, the best, the greatest, it's all finite. It's all driven by this way of being in the world that causes us to want to grasp and hoard and keep as much as we can for ourselves. Even when we take the time to say, wait a minute, it's all going to end anyway. All of it ends. It may come as a shock to hear this, but uh, no one makes it out alive. And none of what we grasp at, of what we hold on to as a way of defining who we are and showing off how much better or more or whatever it may be that we are than the other, none of what we grasp at to define us, whether it's through work or intellect or relationships or social status or anything else we can think of, none of it lasts. It's all going to end. But when the complete comes, when the final victory happens, and we feast at that heavenly banquet, when the complete comes, then the partial, the incomplete way we see and believe and live, when the complete comes, then the partial will come to an end. What we know only in part. What we know in this world, what we experience and focus on and understand, it's only a part. It's only a piece. We cannot at this time understand or see or experience fully. Even Paul said, one of the greatest that we look to, we have his writings in the Bible. He even said, I am in a, in a part. The best theologians, the greatest minds of all time, the Einsteins of the world, they can only know or understand in part. The greatest martyrs, the Mother Teresas of the ages, they can only grasp in part. 
the greatest mystics, whether we're talking about the Dalai Lama or St. Teresa of Avila, the greatest of minds of human compassion and mystery understandings, they can only know in part. And what they do understand, what they do comprehend, what they do know, even that will end. The complete has not yet come. So understanding fully cannot happen yet. Paul writes, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. He could have said, only children think that they can know and understand everything. Only children think they can ever achieve the greatest of things in the world, the greatest of gifts and graces and the completeness that they think they can experience. Only a child would ever think that that is actually possible in this lifetime. Only a child would cling to the finite thing. Only a child would try to define themselves by what they have, or what they know, or even whom they know. Clinging to the finite things of this world is for children, my friends. We see dimly. We see in a mirror. And I'm not talking about a mirror like what we know today. Paul didn't have those kind of mirrors, so maybe it's better to say we see as if we're squinting and turning our head sideways and trying to get it just right. And yet it's still distorted. It's still distorted. We still cannot get the full image or understanding. Maturity of life, maturity of faith, Living lives that are grounded in truth tells us that as soon as we think we know, as soon as we think we've got it figured out, as soon as we think we've got the right grasp on the right thing, maturity comes in and says, that's just a part of it. That's just a piece. That's not all. I think in some ways, the reasons that we grasp so tightly onto these finite things in this world, the, the reason we function from this scarcity mindset is because on some basic level, we know this truth. We know that we can only ever understand this world in part. And because we know on some level that we can never fully understand this world, we end up grasping, holding tightly onto what little bit, what small part, what little tiny element we might be able to hold onto. You see, everything, everything is going to come to an end. So we grasp onto what little bit we can while we are here because on some basic level, it's the only way we think we can make it last. On some basic level, we think holding on to it is going to make it to the end. But it's not. There's only one way that never ends. Love is the only thing that was and is and is to come. And the thing is, my friends, we worship the source of that love. We worship the one who was and is and is to come. Yahweh, the creator of all things. God who was and is and is to come. The source of the one thing 
Instead of grasping for all these things that we know in, for all these things that we know are finite, like we're talking about the large geopolitical border stuff, or we're talking about the extra 20 bucks in our pocket. Instead of grasping on to all of these things that we know will end in some way, what would it be like if we held on to love? instead. If we held on to the one that we follow, seeking <coughs> to be the love that the world needs, the example of God's kingdom. Paul writes, now faith, hope, and love remain. And the greatest of these is love. Even Faith and hope pale in comparison to love. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But when the complete comes, when we are known in full, we'll be able to see fully because we'll be fully seen. And in that, love is the only thing that will remain. Until that day, let us be the love that the world needs as we choose to cling to the one that never ends. Amen. Amen. Now, I know we already heard a witness from Miss Agatha this morning, and that was an amazing witness of being here with us. I want to just take a moment and invite if anybody else feels called or compelled to share a witness with us this morning, now is your opportunity. All right, y'all been doing a good job of this anyway, so I'll let it slide today. I would invite you to turn. You may remain seated as we sing hymn 389, Freely Freely.
agape love, the sacrificial love seen in Jesus Christ. We come before you praising your name and shouting for joy because you have loved us freely. We can never praise you enough because the gifts you have given are without end. The joy of your presence is beyond anything we may know in this world. And so we praise your name and join the unending hymn of love with all creation. We confess, Lord, that we have failed to love, instead choosing to cling to things that end, the things that are of this world. Forgive us, we pray, even as we seek to do better, to be better, to love better in this world that waits for your completeness to come. We ask you, Creator, to create in us the people of Wesley, a revitalized church, a church with a new mission, a new focus, a new ministry field where we can sow and reap for your kingdom's glory. Guide us to that ministry that we may know in truth that you are in it and it is the place you would have us fish for your kingdom. There are those listed in our prayers this day, those people who are shut in and unable to worship with us in person. Lord, we ask for your spirit to rest with them, that they may know that they are with us in spirit just as we are with them. Lord, there are those we pray for this day whose bodies are fighting illnesses. And so we pray now for your healing and we claim your Holy Spirit's anointing on their bodies and in their lives that they may be restored to the fullness of life for your glory in this world. Lord, there are prayers and praises, some we have heard and some that remain yet silent in the hearts and minds of those hearing my voice. And so we lift all those prayers, all those praises, joys, concerns, and we lay them at the foot of the cross knowing that you can and will answer all who ask. All this we bring to you today in the power of your Holy Spirit, the very Spirit that we know dwells in the hearts and minds of all who call you Lord. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who taught us while he was yet living with us to pray together these words, Say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. I would invite you to stand as you are able and join us as you are comfortable in hymn number 519. Lift every voice and sing. Yeah. 
Thank you. 